The XY Advisor podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. XY Advisor does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Financial advisors help Australians live better lives, and we're great at it. But what about us? For us to thrive in the coming years, I'm here to ask a very big question. How can we live better, run better businesses, and help more clients along the way? My name is Jessica Brady, and I would love for you to join me as I listen and learn from experts who answer these very big questions. I am lucky enough to record most of my podcasts on Gadigal Land. Dash was formed in April 2022, following a merger with financial planning software firm Raw Software, wealth platform software specialist Neo, and platform technology provider Wealtho2. Dash is the first advice technology company to focus on solving problems across the end-to-end advice process. Dash helps. Dash's modular approach allows advisors to tailor their best of breed tech stack, helping streamline processes and leaving advisors time to focus on maintaining their clients' experience. This week, I speak to Tamar Balkan. She has been an organizational psychologist for over 20 years. She thinks that work and life should be enjoyable, challenging, and energizing. To speak on all things this week, leaderly, How can we cultivate great leadership skills? What does it actually practically take in this day and age? And how can we become better leaders in the year ahead? Enjoy. Hi, Tamar. Hi, Jess. This is going to be a beautifully timed chat. I know that you and I could talk about this topic all day long, but I feel that this is the right time of year to be thinking about the year ahead and reflecting Uh, and learning and being honest and vulnerable about what we did perhaps that could use some improvement in the upcoming year. So thank you so much for being part of today's podcast. Now, I think before I get into all of the things that I basically want to interrogate you on, (laughs) first, for the people that do not have the delight and privilege of knowing you for a little while, I'd love for you, Tamar, to share your story. No worries. So um, quite interestingly, when I was sitting in year 12 deciding what I wanted to do as a career, Mm -hmm. all I knew was I wanted a profession. I wanted to, I I sort of thought, well, if I I could be a photographer, it didn't matter what it was, but I I didn't want a general degree. And I guessed Mm -hmm. my marks and there was either optometry or psychology. And I thought, "Mm, can't test eyes all day, so let's do psychology. And sat in my first lecture and went, oh, this is fascinating. I absolutely love this. I'm hooked. And I loved every part of my degree. And and then I I worked for a couple of years in child protection, realised it was far too emotionally draining, and called a colleague who was a couple of years older than me, and I said to her, what's organisational psychology like? And she said, oh, people don't have to be in the gutter to make a difference to their lives. If you can make the world of work meaningful, engaging, that people bounce out of bed excited about their day at work, then it is the most rewarding thing. And that's what organisational psychologists do. It's anything to do with human behaviour in the workplace. So off I went, embraced it, learned about the corporate world. My first role when I graduated from the master's program was in consulting at a place called Mercer, a lot of remuneration. Um, and then by pure serendipity, I landed in a leadership coaching role. And I realized very quickly that while consulting, you have impact across the entire large chunks of a business, the beauty of leadership coaching is that you work with an individual on what is important to them. And, you know, some of the listeners may have a similar experience in the type of work that you all do. And it's extremely there is obviously the flow and effect. Anyone who's worked for a boss or is a boss knows that how they behave flows onto many around them, colleagues, staff, 
stakeholders, etc. And so for me to have the real honour of sitting down with leaders and help them grow themselves as individuals, I know will flows on to all those around them. And, and I love catching up six months later after coaching's ended, just out of complete curiosity to just find out where they're at, what's going on, what's going on in their industry. So I feel very spoilt with my career. And, and I guess the knowledge of what, what goes on in human behavior in the workplace and hopefully some of the stuff we discussed today has enabled me to really carve out a fabulous, fabulous work life. And I think everybody else should have one too. So my rose colored glasses, um, are the, the link back to the optometry, but I think they, um, they put me in good stead. No, I'm with you. I'm with you 100%. So talking about, this idea of focusing on helping leaders, what do you mainly focus on with these leaders? So if I think of the general topics, um, firstly, I've worked with leaders in all industries across all different levels. And um, the main topics, the main sort of areas of development for people are self-awareness, emotional intelligence and a really good understanding of well-being because they're the things that any leader in any organisation needs to create mm. what we're now calling a psychologically healthy and safe workplace, basically a place where employees can thrive. My referrals um, are usually around about three or four areas. Um, can be the newly promoted leader. Um, if I think of a recent fellow, really... Um, you really want to maintain his personality and his um, his general demeanour and his style with interacting with people while he got promoted. So he was a what I'd call a politely assertive fellow. Everyone around him was pretty aggressive and he wanted to ensure that he maintained that kindness really and still achieve the same results and it was extremely delightful to watch that and, and to follow up later. I work with existing leaders who often will come to me and go, Tamar, there's something that's not quite right. There's some area I need to develop on. Um, things aren't humming the way they should in my team, in my industry, for myself. They often can't point their finger on a specific thing. Mm. Um, I, I will occasionally get referrals from high performers who have acquired some bad habits and it's really derailing for themselves and others. And they're really challenging situations both for the individual and then for those around them. And also where there's change because what happens is that people, you know, the leadership team has to implement the change. I mean, your sector's had lots of change going on and the buck stops with whoever's running the show to make sure that they're on top of what needs to be done, they're positive about it, they take everybody else's circumstances into account, et cetera, et cetera, they comply, all of that. But in order to do that, that's a huge task. And so mm. it's been particularly um, particularly rewarding to work either with the leader of that change or even occasionally the entire executive team to provide them with the support they need. And, and then amongst all those conversations comes the greater need for self-awareness, the need for emotional intelligence and then for well-being. And then, of course, I sort of see myself as a librarian. You know, I have at my fingertips all the information about human behaviour at work and, you know, whether it's negotiation, performance management, decision-making, the whole gamut of anything in that realm that then that comes up. Um, and clients will bring examples of what's gone on in their, you know, we meet monthly and they'll bring an example of what's happened in the previous month and and often in the in the process of understanding that particular example and working through it, then we're simultaneously working on their goals and skills. Um, and, and often, you know, there's an emerging goal that comes out. Someone comes to me with a view they're going to work on X and as we have more conversations, it's actually Y that they need to be focusing on. Um, so, yeah, that's a broad area. I know I need to be succinct with that sort of no, 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 but it's interesting and it does require so much self-awareness to be like, okay, I'm really good at this but actually here's a blind spot and to be brave enough to reach out to someone to say to be a, the best leader that I can be, I need to be 
getting the professional help and coaching to drive me through that. So I think that that requires an enormous amount of self-awareness, honesty, vulnerability, and proactivity really to go and hunt down someone like yourself and have that conversation. And as you say, people might start coming to you for one particular reason and then through your work find out, oh, maybe there's something else that I need to do instead. And look, to that point, sometimes the referrals come from someone more senior within an organisation mm. or a colleague or an investor or, you know, whatever it may be. So that's also often the route that people come to me. You know, I did a leadership course years ago and one of the things that came out, which I thought was quite fascinating, was I think we, we were classed as emerging leaders, let's just call it that, inside a big corporate. So people who had been identified that could go and do the leadership thing in future years. And the common feedback, Tamar, that came through from our cohort was we don't really feel like leaders. You know, we're in these big organisations. We don't have any autonomy. We don't have teams. We don't feel like leaders. And how the lady responded was fascinating. And she said, you just need to act leaderly. She said, when those moments arrive, you need to act leaderly. And for me, something inside my brain was like, ah, oh, that makes sense. And I can have permission. You know, when you're in a big machine, sometimes you don't always feel like you can be a leader or maybe you're crossing to um, stepping on toes and things. But it was quite a, an interesting idea. I mean, do you think that leadership and strong leadership needs to be cultivated inside businesses of every size? Look, I think, you know, that there are some people who talk about you should lead from wherever you are. Um, and in that sense, that's, you know, just setting a good example. Um, um, you know, model kindness and politeness and, and everybody has that responsibility. You know, it's, um, it's really interesting because, um, I've got a quote from Stephen Covey. He said, you know, we judge ourselves by our intentions and others by their behavior. <laughs> and I think that, therefore, when we want to influence others, and, and every role you have a, a, a reason to be um, influencing, whether you're influencing a customer, a stakeholder, a colleague, someone more senior, etc., cetera, um, how you actually do that and how you go about that is does demonstrate leadership. And those... Those key skills that I talk to my clients about, self-awareness, emotion intelligence, well-being, even feedback, negotiation, managing conflicts, collaboration, creativity, the list could go on, that mm. they're essential for every individual in an organisation. And the flatter the structures are getting and the more... Um, cross-business work that is done or even in a small business, the type of partnerships and collaborations you may do, then these skills are very apparent. And and I think the other area, you know, which I'll um, perhaps we'll come back to a bit later, which is around empathy and listening and suspending judgment, that they are all critical. And so... I guess for the emerging leader and the leader is somewhere new is that you should always be developing those skills and, and looking for examples for where you can lead. And, and I think the other thing about leadership is ethics. So, yes, when you don't have a lot of choice and you're more, for want of a better word, junior within an organisation, it seems that everything's prescribed. But there are always grey areas. And so your values and your ethical principles, be they come from an external code of conduct, even in those circumstances, there's greyness, you know, and, and that sets the tone for the type of person you want to be and how you behave towards others and how you lead by example. Um, and, and I think it's really critical. So it's so you sort of, the emergent leader is thinking about how are they developing all these skills and how can they use their presence and their behaviour for good. It's so fascinating because I feel, and I could be wrong, send hate mail to the usual place, but I feel like when you're in a small, busy business where there, as you say, has been a lot of legislative and regulatory change which keeps you busy on top of managing client strategies on top of managing the business at large, 
you can often feel that there isn't a need for intentional leadership. But what you're saying is exactly the opposite to that, which really deep down, you know, (laughs) which is actually spending that time thinking about what an example you are setting and how you can improve to the benefit of everyone around you. I guess what I'd be keen to do today is to learn a bit more about practically what we should be looking for and how do we do that. So to sort of kick that off, I'm, I'm keen to learn how can leaders start to create teams that are full of happy, fulfilled team members? Um, it, it's like the magic question, isn't it? How can make sure everybody is happy and they're all content and they're all engaged? And um, and I think the other thing with a small business is that you want to know, you know, your reputation, yes, is your results, but it's also the customer service factor. It's also how are you having all those client interactions and and the research indicates, but also we know intuitively that if your staff are content, then they're going to be really polite to customers. They're going to think about, you know, the customer, the client's money is my money, you know, or, mm. or this person's like my my mum, you know, and, and I'm going to have that same level of care and respect. And, you know, that's what helps a lot of small businesses in, in any arena stand out. You know, when we at, at the fundamental level, you want to be certain that there's a job fit. You want to be sure that everybody knows what they're meant to be doing in their roles and that mm. it's the right thing for them. And not just in terms of can they do the job. You know, we often look at this skill match, can they do the job? But but do they want to be doing the job? Does it fit what they need out of work? Does it fit what they, they're interested in? And so obviously, you know, in challenging economic times, people can't necessarily choose where they're at and their careers are where they are. But to sit down every now and again with your staff and really get a sense of what they're loving about their work, what they're not, see if there's ways, you know, there are some people who find I mean, amongst us, even a small team, there are aspects of jobs that some of us hate and that some absolutely love. And, and if there can even be a small amount of what we would call job crafting or shuffling, just to improve that fit, it's really important. Mm. The emotional side of what we do. So, you know, allowing people and encouraging them that after a fantastic client experience to just stop and go, wow, that was fabulous. You know, if we weren't on a podcast, people would say my arms are up in the air. Mm-hmm. To allow that, we, we never stop even for a minute and just allow that positive emotion to bubble up, to have the smile on our face. Not, not about, you know, some external reward, but that intrinsic feeling of, I did that. I, I, I cracked that hard now. I, I got that sale and I was able to deliver for, set that person up for exactly what they wanted. Or I was able to negotiate something with an external stakeholder, whatever it may be. It doesn't have to be a huge thing, but to just savor that moment and, and if appropriate, share it with someone. You know, even if it's a friend who has no idea what you're really talking about, to just share it, um, it's not bragging. It just enables you. You can even say I had a fabulous day today. You know, I just, mm. but, you know. Um, the other thing is, is that emotional support after challenging experiences, dealing with a regulator, dealing with an angry customer, you know, that's part of every job. And, and a boss who has a non-judgmental listening ear for their staff and makes it normal for people to come and say, oh, good heavens above, that was really draining. And it is so frustrating. And I know we have to do it, but I just need to walk around the block before I do something else, to insert a pause and, and for the boss to be role modeling that mm. kind of thing. The, the other thing that's good is this idea of purpose. Now, purpose is a very used, overused word. Um, mm. and it really is for an individual to have an understanding of what their contribution is to others. So if you weren't there, what would fall apart? Or what's the final result of their work? You know, to me, it's very straightforward. I see that my leaders have improved in their leadership skills. Um, but it, it's really, you know, I had somebody in financial services say to me once, you know, Tamar, people work so hard. The average Australian is working really hard and I want to make sure that they get, 
they get what their money works for them and they are able to either, you know, have the retirement that they want or or be able to live the lifestyle that they want despite the fact that they are working so many long hours and that is my role. And mm. and they could see that line of sight because, you know, they were sitting down with people before and every role has that has that opportunity for that line of sight. There are also, look, I, I think we underestimate the ability of listening, of really sitting down and listening to other people. I think there's also a fear that if you understand what somebody's saying, it means you agree with them. And for a leader to suspend judgment and simply listen to what's going on with their staff, you, you know, that, that's real empathy. You put aside your judgment, you just listen without prejudice and you, you are just simply curious. Um, now the, the challenge with empathy and, and, you know, this is a high level EQ and it really works well in teams is you may not be able to change the message you've got to give to your staff. You know, profits may have been down and no one's getting bonuses. But the manner in which you delivered and the empathy for your employees, as well as the communication throughout the year, so that, you know, there's this awareness variable, pay is variable, you know, um, that all of that comes together and, and that helps to build the spirit of your team. Mm. You know, EQ, EQ is a big one. Emotion intelligence, because what emotion intelligence does, understanding the impacts of emotions on your behavior, on the behavior of others, and also how emotions can enable you to be more creative, that cultivating all of that within your team gives people within their scope the autonomy to, to thrive and to do well. Um, and, and I always harp back to self-awareness. And, and I, you know, there's a, a lovely researcher called Dr. Tasha Ulrich, and she calls self-awareness the meta skill of the 21st century. Because if we understand the impact of our behavior on others, then we know what we do that will help others thrive and what we're doing that's just, to put it really simply, rubbing people up the wrong way. Mm. It's, and I, I'm going to say one last thing, though, Jess, because I know, and ultimately kindness, to be honest, mm. you know, and I would imagine everybody sitting back when they thought about how they're going to start their business and how they want to treat their people, if they just stop and think, hmm, is this kind? You know, am I just behaving in a kind manner? And we all respond to kindness, kindness in feedback, kindness in motivation, Good morning, how are you? How was the weekend? You know, just simple manners, very old-fashioned stuff, really delightful. And and everyone loves being treated nicely. It's very inspiring and motivating. And it seems so obvious and so easy, yet I can imagine it's actually not as common as we would hope or expect it to be. Uh, but to your point, no one sets out to build a team that's full of unkind leaders or t- for you to behave unkindly to your staff while you're being so very kind and so very EQ driven when you're having conversations with clients. I think it's a really interesting contradiction, actually, because we pride ourselves on having really great conversations with the clients that we help. But I often get feedback from the financial services community at large that actually even having the opportunity to start having these conversations is rarely in place. So, you know, in small to medium business land, I think it's probably fair to say there isn't a formal feedback loop often created for staff members or, you know, just time in leaders' diaries for staff to come up and feel safe to say, hey, I need to talk about something that might not be a client strategy. It might be a personal, you know, how someone's feeling about something that's happened because people are busy. And all of this stuff is not hard, but I think it gets pushed away when busyness happens. Does that sound familiar? Look, I think, you know, ultimately small business owners are It's hard work, you know. Mm. It's just, you know, let's be honest, there is a lot that falls on the shoulders of the small business owner. The buck stops with you for everything ultimately. Of course you have teams, of course you outsource some things, et cetera, but but that that passion 
and that mm. weight of responsibility. You know, when I look at well-being and, and one of the huge dimensions of dimensions of well-being is what we call flow where you get completely absorbed in an activity that you lose track of time which as listeners will notice is what happens to me when I talk about anything to do with psychology but Mm -hmm. the flip side of that can be this absorption in the work and then not the pause to say well what does the team need and And there is the rigidity sometimes in large corporates. You know, you have your one-on-one catch-ups and then the skip leader catch-ups and the who knows what those or complicated terms may be. Mm. But to have a routine where you really do grab a coffee, have a half an hour phone conversation, whatever it may be, whatever's practical, with every member of your team on a regular basis, it sets the tone, it makes it much more comfortable to raise issues when they arise, also give praise, also get their input and their creativity because, let's face it, all your staff are interacting with other customers. You're not all talking to the same or they're talking to other stakeholders and they've probably got some really cool ideas and some really interesting perspectives and and I'm going to hazard a guess that everybody employs lovely, smart, capable individuals who whom they respect and therefore you don't want to sell yourself short by not getting the opportunity to hear what people have to say. And I think to your point of why don't we do it, I think that we also fall into bad habits. I think that what just happens is when we're tired, stressed and bored, the dark side of our personality comes out. Now, Typically, the small owner, business owner may not fall in that board space, but they might. You know, there, there's this sense of, oh, no, you're always, you're always inspired, but, but maybe, maybe you're not anymore. But to be self aware that what, what happens to you when you're tired, stressed and bored? And what do you need to do for your well being in order to be aware that those things are happening and then insert the pause and put a check on yourself and say, right, you know, do I actually need, what things do I need to do? What are what I would call my well-being not negotiables in order to short circuit this tired, because tired is often linked to stress, stress and and boredom um, and to start being the type of leader that you want to do, want to be. Mm, Because I feel that that is, very relevant to us. You know, we've had enormous regulatory change and I feel that there are leaders who are feeling, I mean, I would say tired, exhausted, probably frustrated and angry at all of the consistent regulatory change. And I'm keen for your thoughts just off the back of this well-being non-negotiable concept. Like what are your tips and techniques like for us to get out of feeling like that? Look, I think we can't underestimate and, and it is worth and noting the elephant in the room and with your teams, you know, it's not just regulation that's happened. We've had, we've had a global pandemic. The economy's changing. Mm. There's pressure. Who knows what's happening next? Um, there are skills shortages where there's flow and effects to every industry. There was a, there was loneliness that was coming into everybody's lives and workplaces. And we were already talking about wellbeing before all of this happened. What I will say, because these are my rose-coloured glasses and I've been in a highly regulated profession since I was 21 and I'm now 50, yeah. um, there's benefits to a regulated profession. There's a lot of benefits. The fact that a potential client can look you up and see what are the rules around how you are meant to behave and what are the ethical standards and what is the regulation that influences what you do and are you part of that, you know, or are you a snake oil salesman? It elevates your brand. Mm. It's actually a brilliant thing. I mean, for me, it takes eight years to call myself an organisational psychologist and I have annual requirements every year with professional development. I have this code of ethics, but but there's a whole lot then that comes with my brand. And and the same will start to, and there's a complaints forum and all those, obviously there are the spurious complaints. But back to your question, how do we refresh? How do we reboot? How do we, you know, how do we notice if we're slipping into burnout, if we're tired, if we're exhausted? And, 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 and sometimes we just need a jolly good break. 
We need a proper holiday where we switch off completely, where we're not thinking about anything to do with work, where you can shake off that physical e- e- exhaustion from work. Because even if we're not in labour jobs, we get tired, we get physically tired. And that requires boundaries. It requires some strong boundaries, which should then flow over into the work routine. So, mm-hmm. you know, Maybe you can never stop thinking about your work because it's your business, but you're not going to send an email on the weekend or after hours. You may save them as drafts and the techie people tell me you can schedule them to go later, whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they're your boundaries. Know what gives you flow. Flow is one of the things Martin Seligman talks about, which increases your well-being. And if you love your job, then carve out uninterrupted pockets of time. Yes, we cannot multitask. We switch tasks. Complete uninterrupted, what one of my client organisations decided to call the hour of power. And in that mm. hour, emails are off. Everything's off. I mean, you and I have carved out this pocket of time for this conversation and, mm. you know, everybody's able to do it when they're with a client. You're not, you know, you're not responding to emails. You're giving them full attention. So it's giving yourself permission for that. Yeah. Things, um, having time for relationships in work and out of work that are healthy, that are enjoyable. Remembering leisure, you know, leisure is not for retirees. Leisure is for all of us. And it's carving out what what do you like to do for leisure and how can you do it? Um, you know, is the commute a great time to listen to a novel on, on Audible or whatever mm. your audio book thing is rather than be scrolling through reading the emails, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if you're not commuting, oh, what are you going to do with that extra hour? Are you going mm-hmm. to engage in one of your lovely leisure activities or are you going to respond to emails? Um, and how can you insert pauses in the day? I have a client who will just in between meetings sit for five minutes under a tree. Um, there's a There's a concept called the third space. So Mm -hmm. the first space is where you've been, the second space is the time in the middle, and the third is where you're going. And so if you have meetings that are 55 minutes, you can spend that little gap in between doing your third space. So what you do, you write your to-do list, you wrap up all your ideas from where you have been. In the middle, your middle space, you do a relaxation, what I call a relaxation quickie. Um... And sometimes it's just some deep breathing, doesn't have to be complicated, dancing around to some music, whatever it is. And Mm -hmm. then the last bit is what are you planning to get out of the next activity you're going to? So you have a focus and a purpose. Those little micro pauses engage you and energise you for the rest of the day and they're going to fill your wellbeing cup because wellbeing is a seesaw from demands and resources. And the more... Sometimes, you know, a resource is delegation. It is, is this actually urgent? Is it even important? Why on earth am I doing it? So that's I'm going to get rid of a resource, uh, rid of a demand. But other times we need to be saying, well, what do we do to fill up our resources? I, and I guess to not forget the health bit because that's what everybody talks about with well-being. And I have a client, one of his well-being not negotiables is his orange at morning tea. And I'm like, what, what's so special about the orange? He said, well, Tana, I put away my phone and my AirPods and then I eat this orange. And oranges are messy. Mm. So I can't do any work. And I have to wash my hands afterwards. Sometimes I even have to floss so the dentist is happy. And I'm taking a pause. And, of course, you know, the vitamin C and it's a juicy piece of fruit and I can get it all year round and I can buy 10 and they can sit in the fridge and nothing's going to happen to them. And, you know, it's just an example of one thing that you can do that's manageable. You know, we often think that anything to do with well-being is huge and it's complicated and it's expensive Hmm. and and it needs to be individualized and I get a lot of pleasure when I work with my clients and we work out well what is it for them what are their well-being not negotiables and how are they going to remain accountable are they going to tell a colleague it's orange o'clock or 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 you tell your team remind me Wednesday is soccer practice and I'm leaving at 5 p.m. 
Mm. You know, whatever it is. And, and, and as the leader, back to the leader's role, be loud and proud about what you are doing. Tell your staff, I am going for a lunch break once a week, which means I'm not eating at my desk and I'm finding fresh air. Mm. I do really feel that the leader sets the tone with that, don't they? Because if they're the sort of leader that says, every day I see you wasting 15 minutes faffing about with an orange, then you're really saying to the entire team, you must look like you're working at all times, otherwise my perception is you're not productive. We've come so far in leadership, haven't we? Because that was sort of the old way. Definitely. And so maybe we all need orange (laughs) o'clock. I'm imagining uh, it is messy. I'm imagining the issues that would come with orange (laughs) o'clock. But I also think, you know, it's important for us to unlearn that behaviour, to unlearn that you need to be, you know, that, that busyness, the concept of busyness isn't really all it's cracked up to be. You know, I felt like for a long time it was like who was out busying each other. I'm so busy. I'm so busy. And creating those boundaries. Personally, Tamar, I found it quite hard to build those boundaries because there was just such a big pile of work and I just thought, well, I have to plough through it and I can promise you that that wasn't the right strategy. Um, Do you think that modern fantastic leaders are honest about their shift in mindset as well so that they can take their team on the journey if they have been like that in the past? There's a really interesting thing around the self-disclosure piece from a leader so it can be a bit patronising. Um, hmm. What works better is to just do things. Yeah, right. Just do it, Nike, just do it, you know, um, and, and just be aware and, and get your team to be accountable, to keep you accountable, hmm. um, you know, that it just becomes a habit. Um, I had a client who was rubbing everybody up the wrong way and he was a very motivated, enthusiastic guy and he would just send these emails all the time because he had these ideas and he said to me, but Tamar, they're not going to read them. I've told them not to read them. I said, yeah, but they see your name in their inbox and that's enough. And, and it, the penny dropped because I, you know, I said, you know, we you had to increase the self-awareness and how could he deal with his enthusiasm and his energy in a way that fed his soul but didn't impact everybody else. Um, I, I do know of one boss who took his employee's phone and deleted the mail app and said, I do not want you having, when you are not, this was a pre-pandemic when everyone was in the office, working off laptops, he said, I don't want you to have anything to do with your work when you are not sitting at your desk. So, you know, I mean, that that's a, that's a, that's definitely a, a public statement. Um, but also that idea of just really talking about what you are trying to do, but also to realise the individual differences, you know, and that's back to those conversations. Get to know your team because some people can concentrate for three hours straight and then they need a long lunch break and, and other people, their concentration's only an hour or they need a variety between talking to people and writing or talking and researching or planning or, you know, is is it business development more effective on a Monday? And and also a bit of serendipity in life. So shake up the routine, encourage your staff to, because ideas come whenever, but all sorts of different random occasions. And and you need that break. What did one of my clients say to me? I need thinking time in my diary. Mm. I need, you know, there's there's that adage, you need time to be thinking about the business as well as working in the business. And I think that applies for roles and jobs as well. At Macquarie, they used to call it balcony time. And they used to say to us, make sure that you've got time in your diary to just think. And it's an interesting, it's an interesting way to get everyone in the business to feel like they've got time to think about ideas that will matter irrespective of whether you are a leader or not, to be given permission to do that really fosters an ideas-based culture where people know that innovation is wanted and that you, if you are up on the balcony looking like you're dawdling about, people know that that's okay, that you're not just staring into the wind thinking about what's for dinner. I want to talk, I sort of mentioned it a little bit earlier, 
because I found this quite challenging through my own journey and I know that many people in the podcast will have had similar experiences or are going through similar experiences. When you're a new leader or you step into a leadership position where maybe you've worked in the business for a long time and then you've taken on a leadership position, which can be challenging, I'd imagine, it can be quite scary and it can be a bit overwhelming. What, like, is it normal to feel, you know, challenged when you take on a new leadership role? And if so, what would you say to the people that right now are going into work terrified being a leader? (laughs) So I think that, you know, I think for the most people, there's this mix between excitement and pride and, you know, I've worked hard for this, other people have acknowledged it. And then there's the, wow, so what am I going to do with this responsibility? And there is inherently more complexity to my job because it's it's a different role. Mm. I think the other thing is, is that people, you also know whether you're new to the organisation or you've been in the organisation, people have preconceived ideas about you. They, they they think about how you're going to behave, what you think about particular topics, how much you know about the industry, etc. Unfortunately, social psychologists have found that first impressions do count, that we do make judgments upon others. It doesn't mean that we can't rectify that, certainly not, um, and everybody's made, you know, blunders and, and have recovered from them. I think there's also everybody has around you has a belief about what a leader should be. Um, so there, there is that there there is a book called What Got You Here Won't Get You There. Um, in other words, there really is a step up. So there there is preparation you can do. You know, remind yourself what is it about this industry, about this firm, about this role that's really exciting. What types of things do you want to achieve? What are your broad strategic goals? What, um, you know, financial growth, market share, corporate image, innovation, culture, employees, all of that. What do other people expect from you? So what do the stakeholders expect if there's a board, if there are funders, if you're reporting into somebody, what do they expect? What do your external customers expect? What's, you know, what's going on outside the business? So what are the external impacts on the business? who's the competitor, Um, what's going to be your competitive advantage, what are trends, then you need to define your ethics and values. Sit down and work out what your ethics are so that when you get to the grey areas and they will inevitably happen and they'll happen all the time, Mm. that you know how you're making decisions. Because all that stuff we just spoke about, about boundaries and well-being and, and how you're going to behave, well, you need to know what really matters to you to know what calls you're going to make in all those situations. And the more senior you are in any type of organisation, the more complicated the decisions that you're going to make are and the less frameworks and guidelines there are because there's 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 grey. And so knowing what it is. The other thing is know your purpose and, and know your purpose, you know, which is, who is, what, who is benefiting from what you are doing? It's almost like when you take on a leadership position, you need to sit down and write your framework about who you're going to be because you, you made a point earlier around like, well, who are you going to be as a leader and just sort of needing to step into almost a persona that maybe doesn't always feel like you but still with your ethics and boundaries. Um, and I think that that's a really fascinating concept to step into a leadership position, but also to step into behaving in a way that might be new and scary, but is aligned to what you want to be and how you want to be as a leader. Quite a lot of intentionality behind that, that I don't think I've ever given thought, enough thought to actually sitting and writing down. But I like the idea. The other thing is, don't forget your, what I would call your cheer squad. Who is it that encouraged you to take this role? Who is it that is, who's going to benefit from your success and how can you get them to motivate you? Because it's going to get tough. Mm. Increase, keep working on your self-awareness. So get feedback and feedback from people who actually will see the things you want them to see and who are comfortable to give you that feedback and then act on it. 
digest it, you know, get a very, you know, you guys know how to research, right? You don't just use one source, get a variety, yeah. think about it, integrate it, and then work on it. And and think about also with that self-awareness piece, how do you remain motivated? You know, all those leaders who had to take their organisation through the really stressful patch where there was regulation, where there was investigation, how did they, what is it that that will keep you going? What will drive you? Do you need a picture on your laptop of the customer so that you know that it's Mary Lou who, and it, it's to keep Mary Lou's life well and financial well-being, et cetera, and that's why you're doing the work. So know mm. what that is. And and um, and I guess also the keeping on track thing is know when you have to pivot, you know, and and you are you very and whether that pivot is in the composition of your team, in what people are focused on, in or in you know the economy has shifted suddenly. Um, I don't think anybody predicted what was going to happen to interest rates. Hmm. You know, how are you going to pivot, and and do you need to do something different to make yourself stand out as an organisation? And and so all of that is the ongoing thought. And also think about what support do you need? Who do you need somebody external to your organisation with whom you can bounce ideas off, grow yourself as a leader? You know, I um, I think, you know, it's a, it's a lovely opportunity for my clients that when they talk to me, they know that I don't sit in their business. I don't have any influence over the work they get, their pay, their opportunities, et cetera, et cetera. And because I'm a registered organizational psychologist, it's completely confidential. Mm. They don't have to talk with tact necessarily. They can talk openly about situations, ideas, mull it through and help clarify because, yes, you're saying sit down and work out what type of leader you want to be, but it's not all that easy to do on your own and yeah. and also to nut out the conundrums when they arrive. So you have this circumstance and you've got, you've got to make a call within whatever period of time. You think you know your values and ethics, but you really want an unbiased non-judgmental external context in which to have that conversation and decide and think through the consequences, make a rational decision, etc. So there is a lot, but there's also I think that the, the the thing for all of new leaders to do is to pause and go, I did it. I, I, I you know, I, I got here on my merits and I've worked hard and this is really cool. You know, allow that positive emotion to bubble up and that sense of pride and enjoyment and satisfaction. True. I think that's true for all leaders to take the time to, to mm. do that because it can be lonely and it can be really hard to your point. Totally. I could talk to you all day. Now, I just need to do a small plug because I have got so many people that I get newsletters from. Yours is one that... I have been on the list for a long time and your newsletters are so good. I just need to say that in a very public fashion. And I think sincerely, and I don't think I've ever said this about anyone who's come on as a guest. No offense. If you do newsletters, I may not be getting them or they may not be as good as tomorrow's. <laughs> but I think everyone could learn from yours because it's very evident that you practice what you preach in terms of reflection and well-being and looking after yourself and it's you know it comes out in your work so if people want to learn a bit more about you before we get into rapid fire questions how can they and how can they sign up to your bloody good newsletter firstly thank you i don't know whether it's because i put little song references um <laughs> i have a bit of fun and i think that's something we've forgotten to actually mention today is work can be fun mm. um i am i chose a really simple business name balkan coaching no one had used it so that's Ooh. easy otherwise tamar balkan on linkedin find me say good day and we'll and everything's from there so all my old blogs are on my website so balkancoaching.com.au Mm -hmm. and um and also there's a contact me form and i can pop you onto the mail chip so thank you thank you no problem uh to round out today's very very good conversation i'd love to finish with a piece or a few i should say rapid fire questions are you ready yeah okay let's go Lovely. um i would love to know what is one thing that you do to march look after your mental health i practice what i preach 
Mm. I try really hard. And I also cut my self slack when I don't. Mm. So, but I, I take all the elements of well being and, you know, boundaries, flow, physical health. I'm very proactive with my physical health. I'm very mm. actually, I like preventative. I like to go upstream and look at, you know, what can I do to minimize the likelihood of? I've carved out a good career. Um, good social contacts. Um, and I know as a sole trader, I know when I need social contact professionally. Um, mm. And so I will have coffees. I will meet people other than my clients. I will go to events with colleagues and, and I will learn. So, um, yeah. Very well-rounded answer. Uh, I'd love a piece of advice that you would give to younger Tamar. Don't put off till tomorrow what you can do today. So mm. I could have become a full member of the College of Organisational Psychologists at the age of 25 and I couldn't be bothered doing any more paperwork. And when I waited till my 40s when the legislation changed and the title was Restricted, I needed to do 80 hours of individual supervision, 80 hours of professional development and fill in so many more forms. Wow. <laughs> um, yes, it's a, it was sort of a reminder that, um, yeah. Painful and good lesson for the yes. rest of us. Yes. Uh, one thing that's on your bucket list. Um, uh, well, it's a place I've been before, but I want to go back. Um, and I am fond of travelling in Australia and the Ningaloo Reef in Exmouth mm -hmm. in Western Australia mm -hmm. is just one of the hidden gems of our country. And this is where the whale sharks are? Yes, yes, mm -hmm. and, um, and baby turtles hatch. But also you walk off the sand with your snorkel and there is the reef and there is the wildlife. And the water is turquoise and the sand is white and there's no one else there. You're just like, where shall I sit? Um, it's just absolutely, and, and it doesn't matter what season you go. And so you're on this tropical island, but you're in Australia. So there's Vegemite at the local IGA and it's just fabulous. Red earth and all those wonderful things. And it's just, yeah, I love our country and that is a really magical spot. Hmm. Last question, I know that you've been stewing on this. Gets a lot of people stressed. Do you have a book recommendation for my fake book club? Uh, can I give more than one? Yeah, I mean, you absolutely can. It stresses me out because then I've got to read more great things, but please do. Okay, so my self-awareness book is called Insight by Tasha Ulrich. Mm -hmm. um, all about self-awareness. Mm -hmm. um, there is also a book called Upstream by Chip Heath and Dan Heath. Um, Always good to have a psychologist and a marketer as brothers who write books together. Yeah. Um, they've written a few other books as well, which which um, the audience may find. So just look up Chip Heath and Dan Heath. Mm -hmm. um, another, now this is a novel, but I think that for this audience they may find it really interesting. There's a novelist called Sebastian Fawkes, mm -hmm. and he wrote a book called A Week in December. And it was set around the Christmas of the week before Christmas in 2007, just before the GFC. Oh. And it is just, it traces the lives of a couple of characters, all in different sorts of um, walks of life. And it's fascinating, absolutely fascinating. So I'm amazing. He's, okay. He's a great author. Have a look at some of his other books as well, all sorts of diverse topics. But yeah, Sebastian Hawke. So yeah. I thought I'd better choose something that's good for the audience too. Thank you. Well, Tamar, I know that you and I could talk deeper and longer about all of those points that you made today, but I think you have given all of us a lot of opportunity to reflect on a very big year, but also what we can do from a self-awareness and leadership perspective in the year ahead. So a ginormous thank you on behalf of the XY community for being today's guest. Thank you for having me and have a very relaxing summer. Get some sand in your toes and some mango in your teeth and just enjoy all that we have to offer. Thanks for having me.